I started off writing this video with the historic events around the origin of it, but then I remembered that a lot of folk will click on this video and just want to know all about what this word means immediately and can't sit through 20 minutes of deep lore to fully understand what it's all about. So for you fine folks, here is the basics. Zorvintal is the game. It is a 30,000 year old tradition among the dragons of the world of Toril and many other worlds. To participate in it, a dragon is inducted into the art by another dragon. They undergo a magical ritual, a ritual of Zorvintal, hence the name of the game, where they give up their innate magic powers by spending a month meditating inside a mystic cocoon, emerging as a different sort of dragon called a Tal Darax. The Tal Darax can no longer cast spells, but they do retain any spell-like abilities natural to their subspecies. Instead, they gain the ability to manipulate their minions, to interact telepathically with other Tal Daraxi, and to increase their power as they increase their reputation within the great game. They kind of become Dragon Jedi, political Kung Fu masters, the overlords in the shadows. Tal Daraxi are forbidden from getting into direct physical fights with each other. They must wage war against each other in a chess game, a grand web of intrigue and manipulation that requires a high degree of intelligence in every use of that word, both the gathering of information and the mental capacity to use it. A Taldarax will always have a head servant, a lieutenant called their Ayavac. This uh, was a special position because the Ayavac is magically bonded to the, to the Taldarax, gaining special powers, kind of like a warlock. Other servants under the Taldarax are known as Dukal. They can have their own ranks and titles, but they those vary a lot based on what lineage the Taldarax is from. So who inducted them into the great game? Master and Apprentice. Which is why I mentioned the Jedi comparison. There are way more than just Jedi and Sith traditions in the great game. It's more like all the different martial art traditions of Kung Fu schools. It's super important to know about these traditions in great detail because they all tend to score points in Zorvintal in their own ways. The way the game is played is based on hundreds of rules called precepts. They are very complex and as I said, they are interpreted differently by the different Taldarax lineages. Dragons love this sort of knowledge. Knowing things their opponent doesn't know makes their ego feel good. So they get addicted to learning everything they can about the great game. I mean, sit down with a hardcore fan of Magic the Gathering and they'll start talking gibberish at you very quickly. They'll know what I mean by that. The first precept of Zorvintal is to gain, you must first lose. The ritual that creates the Taldaraxi is exactly that, losing one thing to gain another. Another precept is that players can never directly act against each other. They must use their Ayavac and Dokali unless both Taldaraxi have agreed to fight a duel against each other. And in those circumstances, all their Dokali must fight against the opposing Dokali. Points are generally scored by a Taldaraxi, risking their entire horde of wealth and power, making plays against their opponents to gain even more from each other, if possible. They also score points for taking territory and killing the Dokali of opponents. It's a game of conquest, but the expert use of subterfuge, daring or renown are also ways to score points. The points determine who outranks who among the Taldaraxi, kind of like the ranking of international tennis players. Certain lineages of Taldaraxi are known to be strong in certain aspects of the game when it's played, thanks to their interpretation of the precepts of the great game. Why is this important? Well, the ritual of Zorvintal makes the Taldaraxi unable to break the precepts of the game, so clearly they turn all their attention to finding any loophole or wiggle room within those rules. They rules lawyer it, basically. There are a number of favoured strategies in the great game, and I quote, Castling. The process of moving a Taldaraxi's horde from one place to another. This is like the castling move in chess. It's a complex process that takes years of preparation. Although some players are able to do it quicker than others, earning points in the process, moving the horde makes it vulnerable. But inciting action among your opponents can expose their agents, leaving them open to counterattacks. It generally picks up the intensity of the game, making moves like castling scores good points. The claw test is pre-arranged meeting where the Dokali of many Taldaraxi as well as unwitting agents meet to accomplish some goal on behalf of their masters. War games. 
The winners are those players whose minions accomplish most of their objectives with fewer advantages and resources than their opponent, either because they were restricted or they just don't use them. Killing an opponent with a single claw is more impressive than doing so with a blast of fire and scores more points, basically. Seed Horde, one of the most aggressive strategies of the game, it consists of establishing a new horde in an area the Taldrax doesn't intend to personally occupy. To earn some more points with the strategy, the player has to rely entirely on their minions to establish and protect this new horde. If a seed horde is established near a rival's territory, the owner can earn extra points if the rival is unable to destroy it within a certain amount of time. The precepts forbid the rival Taldrax from attacking the horde directly. They must use any Dokal available for this as quickly and masterfully as they can as soon as they discover it. A seed sham is a fake seed horde made up of an actual treasure rigged with traps and other threats designed to cut away the resources of a specific rival. Failing to discover a seed sham could make a player lose a lot of points and valuable Dakali, but discovering the sham using the rules of the game was the quickest way of earning a lot of points, making it one of the riskier strategies of the game, but very rewarding. Everything is part of the game. Everything can score points. It's all governed by complex precepts and all the lineages play the game in slightly different ways. This is highly addictive for dragons and it was designed to be. So that is the great game in a nutshell. Before I talk about the ancient origins of the game some 30,000 years in Toril's past, here are some more recent events and all this information comes from novels written by various authors set in the realms, namely The God Catcher, and the Brotherhood of the Griffin series. So there was a dragon named Capnolithal, also known as Brimstone, who was involved with the powerful lich arch wizard named Samaster, who was trying to figure out how to turn dragons into liches. He turned Brimstone, a breed of dragon called a smoke drake, into a vampire. But Samaster rejected this as a failure, as vampires have a lot of shortcomings that liches don't have. This pissed Brimstone off quite a lot and he determined to destroy Samasta at the first opportunity. Eventually he was directly involved not only in Samasta's destruction, but also the ending of the ancient Draco Rage curse by destroying the elven Mythal, which generated it, which gave him hero status amongst all the other dragons of Faerun. He lurked around the ruins where Samasta died for a while and in doing so discovered the ancient lost rules of Zorvental. He went on a mission across the Outer Plains to investigate this great game and returned to Toril determined to restart it there in 1479 DR. Travelling to the floating rock moat called Dracoware, high above the land of Murgome. Now, I won't go into great detail about the recent events after that because that's a good series of novels and you should read them for yourself, but I can say that the seeds of the great game have been sown in Faerun once more and the game is very enticing for dragons, so I have no doubt it will begin to flourish all on its own once more. Okay, so now it's time for some ancient history. Sit back, grab yourself a tasty beverage, we're going to get even more deeply nerdy. Zorvental has a very long tradition that stems back to the time of dragon dominance across the world of Toril, in fact many different worlds. Understandably, this is an ancient magic that dragons developed early in their history to curtail their aggression against their own kind and really allow them to evolve into a civilization in the first place. It was not the metallic dragons who came up with this, as far as I know. It was the now vanishingly rare Ferris dragons, who were all but wiped out in the genocidal war with the giants on Toril, but are generally the most common dragons on most other worlds. Toril is very odd. To visiting dragons. It's a dystopian nightmare that a lot of them actually, well, they'll avoid it like the plague. In Toril's long turbulent history, we've had many species ascend to great power and empire. All of them left a lasting legacy, all of them achieved great wonders and left behind a lot of scars. Since the Fae arrived some 33,000 years ago, the elven people have been caretakers of nature and explorers of the mystical, but they've also almost had no checks and balances on the extremes to which they've gone down some very dark paths. For the subject of today's video, this will focus mostly on their efforts to deal with a world dominated by dragons and giants, and how from their perspective, it's understandable that they had to do what they did, but we'll get back to the elves in a moment. First, 
It's important to understand that there are many worlds in the Torellian star system inhabited by dragons, including the world of Eber, the sister planet of Torrell, which is governed by primordials, not gods. In the world of Eber, Zorvental is also known and played by the dragons native to that world. The city of Zorventroth on the planet Eber is named after the game. These days, if you're around the old empires of the south of Thay, you could ask the oldest dragonborn there if they remember the time their people lived on that world, and they all ultimately served one dragon clan or another. But yeah, we are going back in time now to the world that Toril was 30,000 years ago. In the early days, after the creator race's influence had largely declined. Okay, to be more precise, the dragons all teamed up and just burned the cities of the Aeri to a cinder and murdered all of them. There were just the remnants of the old empire, the more civilized dragons of the south, the more feral dragons in the north, and the dark elves. In the south, the fairest dragons dominated. The Aurium dragons were very high ranked. They didn't pay much attention to the north, and the mostly chromatic dragons there who enjoyed a more feral lifestyle, as they considered Tiamat's intent for them was to live more solitary lives as super predators. So the dragon civilization in the south perhaps didn't pay close enough attention to the arrival of Anam, the Allfather, the creator of the giants, and the slow rise of the empire of Astoria in the far north of Faerun, beyond the spine of the world mountain range. You may note that the Dark Elves lived in the south and had an impressive city called Atornash, which was ruled by the Archmage Carnalist. Atornash was a city that welcomed merchants and many other races lived there as second-class citizens. It was very decadent and there were a lot of magic experiments that created a whole heap of monsters used for whatever the wizards and depraved nobles felt like. It was a wild time down south and the Dark Elves had a lot more to do with the dragons than many imagine these days. So Atanash was a city state notable in that it was not ruled by a dragon. At this point in history, things would have remained relatively stable. The Dark Elves kept a reasonably amicable relationship with the dragons. A great many of them happily accepted dragon rule and lived as vassals of dragon kingdoms. These were the dragons who played the great game for the most part. They didn't fight each other directly, tooth and claw. They sparred with each other through their vassals and minions accumulated vast wealth and significant influence. They not only controlled their territory, but influenced the houses of the Dark Elves, a tradition which you see the drow still follow, led by matron mothers rather than dragons these days, but their society is still highly competitive and social standing is extremely important to the drow, just as it was with the Dark Elves, who called themselves Elefieri. Things were going fine. But then there was a lot of turmoil in the outer planes and it all went to hell in a handbasket back in the prime material plane. It was time to enter the age of a thousand year war, for the arrival of the elves from the destruction of Tintagel in the Feywild and for the draconic religions to all but destroy their species completely. For the dark elves, and remember they were on Toril for thousands of years before the other elves arrived from the Feywild. Our Vandor, which was originally the forest near Olympus, their patron gods were Arushni and her daughter Elistrae, both dark elves and considered the most beautiful of all the elven gods. Elves still consider the dark elves the most attractive subrace of their species. Fun fact. Arushni decided she wanted to be in charge. She seduced a solar named Melchizedek to try to help her murder Coralyn, Lorathian, the creator of all of the elves. She even got the ancient and evil primordial god of oozes, Gonadau, involved. Back, uh, meanwhile, back on Toril, the dark elf culture was going crazy with Gonadau being openly worshipped by many. This makes sense if you think about uh, Zorvental and the usefulness of doppelgangers and shapeshifters, so Gonadau isn't such a stretch of the imagination. Even the dragons were like, damn, you little folks are writing the book on decadent debauchery. Chill out, man. And then Carolyn catches on to what his wife is doing, strips her of divine power, banishes her to the abyss through the same portal he used to kick out Gonadau. She becomes the demon queen Lolf at the same time that she rejects Gonadau, who gets so angry he burns the intelligence from the reminds of a lot of intelligent ooze species and shapeshifters that we never even hear about. Still, they include a lot of the Iavax and Dokals in service of the Teldaraxi. Shapeshifters, intelligent mimics, doppelgangers, changelings. Of course, there were tons of them involved in the great game. They were perfectly suited for it and had a high rank 
in dragon society because of it. But suddenly, one day, they just completely screamed and that was it. Most of them were reduced to being animals because of the ego of Gonadar. That bastard. Then, the other elves arrive from the Feywild and unfortunately, they show up in the north and a lot of them get eaten by the less civilized kind of dragons who are causing all sorts of antagonism by stealing the giant's livestock. The giants love their food, so this was a sore point for them. And a lot of the giants just assumed all elves were in service to the dragons, so the newly arrived elves did not have a good time and the seeds of hatred were sown in their hearts for all dragons and giants. The elusive winged elves were the first to arrive and they got so mauled by the dragons, they fled to what is now the remote mountains of Ankarome and are still so few in number most people think they are a myth. A couple of elves headed south to explore and find these dark elves that they'd heard about and discovered the dark elves were just... Well, there was a significant culture shock and they didn't exactly bond as brothers. Meanwhile, the dragons were also involved in a religious upheaval. Draconic religious factions among the clans of the south began to fight over their different philosophies. The most violent conflicts were those fought among the followers of Asgarath, basically chief of the dragons, also known as Io. These form the constant backbone of the Draco Holy Wars. In a nutshell, there was a lot of claims from golds and silvers and reds that Asgarath was more like them than the other two, which obviously the others called utter blasphemy and violence ensued. What set it all off, though, was the assassination of General Nagamat, a devout servant of Tiamat who ruled over what was once the Aeri Kingdom of Shara. He was killed by followers of Bahamut, though if you find any records of the dragons from only tw over 20,000 years ago, you will see they call Bahamut Zymor. That was his name. In retribution, Tiamat unleashed all sorts of dragon-like things during the war, breeding warped creatures from her eggs. These aberrant entities became known as the Spawn of Tiamat, which prompted Zymor to create his own agents, the first Dragonborn, converted from other humanoid species to become his devoted soldiers and knights. Not to be confused with the Dragonborn of a bear now living on Toril, who are a native uh, draconic race who reproduce normally and were never anything other than draconic creatures. This conflict between followers of Tiamat and Zymor is known as the Dragonfall War, and it's still going on to this day. The religious wars of the dragons got so bad, particularly during their genocidal war against the giants of Astoria, that the dragon god Zoukwon stepped in and essentially turned dragons away from their own religion. So much so that today on Toril, most dragons are not really very religious at all. They believe gods who allowed such behavior were not worthy of their worship. Thus, they turned to Zorventhal. It was better for all of them if they established their dominance they craved, not by battling each other, but by this great game that established status in much better ways. It was prophesied among the few remaining worshippers of the Draconic Gods that at a turning of the Great Cycle, they would foretell the return of the religious fervor among dragonkind. This turning happened in 1373 DR, after the last rage of dragons decimated most of the draconic population on Faerun, when the great curse of the elves ended. And this realization sparked the need among the remaining dragons to look for help from their gods. As they say, everyone finds God in a foxhole. The dragon gods who survived the long years without worshippers received a great influx of power from their new draconic followers. However, this also threatens Faerun with the possibility of a new battle in the Dragonfall War, so Return of the Great Game of Zorventhal has become more important than ever for all dragons. When the elves screw someone else over, they don't do it by half measures. So for your amusement, here is a brief list of atrocities the elves have committed on Faerun over the last 25,000 years. 25,000 years ago, the elves created the Draco Rage Mythal in a citadel in the northernmost reaches of Toril, tying it to the appearance of the King Killer Star, a comet. This powerful magic incited dragons across Faerun to madness and mindless destruction, turning against each other and even against their own offspring. This curse lasted for over 26 thousand years. There was resistance to the curse, of course. Even after the dragon realm of Daris Treva Thika was destroyed, a few of the remaining dragon lords tried to destroy the Dracarage Mythal, but the winged elves, the Avariel, sacrificed their lives to protect it, and the dragons were unable to stop the magic fueling their rage. 
The Avarial race was almost wiped out during this battle, and they get next to no credit for it. Meanwhile, Lol finally started to pay attention to Toril and seduced the Dark Elves over to her worship, now as the Demon Queen of Spiders, and the Crown Wars of the Elves kicked off. This era of warfare between the Elven race is full of horrendous war crimes from all sides of the conflicts. Aside from getting a whole lot of the most powerful wizards from lots of different races to sacrifice their lives to summon a chunk of Arvandor and drop it into the trackless sea, creating the islands of Evermeet, but also a massive tidal wave that murdered millions of others, including a whole heap of Dark Elves sometime before the Crown Wars started. The Elves also wiped out a major human civilization called Jamdath, uh, certainly a great subject for a later video but basically the elves were threatened by this human empire and so they used elven high magic to create the Vilhon Reach, drowning the 12 cities of the sword and killing millions of people. Also creating a psychic contamination of that body of water which made some really horrible monsters to spawn there, they're called phrenic monsters. There is a lot more such as the time the elves enslaved every gnome they could find but you get the idea. So how would I use Zorventhal in my D&D campaigns? Well, I quite like the idea that players find or are bestowed some information, perhaps by some incredibly ancient relic of the creator races, perhaps by a god granting a vision to a clerical paladin, or some magic text a spellcaster finds which has some information they finally decipher, which their spellcasting associates have been puzzling over for a thousand years, however it happens. The party comes into possession of an ancient prophecy that foretells a cataclysmic event if certain conditions within the game are met. They must decipher the prophecy's meaning, particularly if they have no idea what Zorventhal even is. They need to gather allies and thwart the plans of the Taldaraxi who seek to fulfill these ominous predictions. It's also fun to unveil the game in such a way that the player's choices really do make a huge impact on the game world. For example, the group discovers that a Mind Flayer Elder Brain has discovered the existence of Zorventhal and that it's being played by a number of Taldaraxi. It then attempts to have its Mind Flayer thralls or some sort of mutant infiltrator implant a Mind Flayer tadpole into the brain of an Iovac or perhaps a Taldaraxi dragon, converting just the mind of the dragon into a thrall. They then start to play the game itself but it's not restricted by the game's precepts anymore its actions in the game are intended to turn all the dragon's activities into a means to manipulate every intelligent being and bring them under the elder brain's tyrannical control if you don't want to go so heavy-handed and just have the players become aware of the game they can encounter a group of non-dragon characters who have become unwitting pawns in the game of zorventhal these characters seek the um, party's help in understanding and navigating the complex web of alliances and rivalries among the dragons. There could be a lot of money and power to be had if the players figure out what moves are being made and manage to steal a heap of treasure or get a lot of incriminating evidence that gives them influence over very powerful merchant lords, um, church leaders and guild masters in the region. As the Taldaraxi involved would be so hyper-focused on their opponents, a third party not part of the game at all could catch them off guard. But beware they are very smart and they're probably precepts of the game rules about just that sort of situation as well discovering a lost precept or being contacted by a double agent iovac or being hired to take down a rogue taldaraxi who discovered some way to beat the game are also excellent hooks into the lore and its place in your campaign for example when zorventhal was invented there was no such thing as a dracolich maybe that breaks the game something to ponder Taldaraxi make excellent secret patrons, crime lords, political influencers, and economic moguls. They can be so powerful and influential that you can run a similar plot for a fighter or a rogue character as you could for a warlock. A Taldarax may hide in plain sight in the guise of a martial arts master who runs one of the powerful crime guilds in the eastern lands of Faerun, where you find some of the awesome pirate organizations or crime networks, gangs, and criminal monastic orders. For example, the Shadow Masters of Teflam, the Nine Golden Swords of Thesk, the Redeemer's Guild known as the Fire Knives, and the Night Masks of Westgate, the Astorians of Tazir. 
Anywhere you find the historic activities of the Cult of the Dragon or the plots of the Zentarum, there could be links to Zorvintal. And of course, anything to do with the Dragon Princes of the land of Murgom and the region surrounding Brightstar Lake, a place of incredible importance. And if you zoom out and look at its location on the continent of Faerun in its entirety, ah, see? It's smack bang in the middle of everything. Its strategic position for spreading the new draconic empire to Faerun and Karatur could not be better, really. Perhaps a video on the Dragon Princes in a lot more detail in future? Just let me know. In the meantime, thank you for listening, and as always, I will be back with more for you very soon.